tonight on Bridge City News. A new poll says Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's approval rating has taken a big hit. We will tell you by how much. The Alberta provincial election is coming up April 16th. Today we look at some of the rural candidates. And an airline ceased operations today, stranding passengers across two continents. Thanks so much for joining us. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's image appears to have taken quite a hit from the SNC-Lavalin scandal. According to a new poll released by Ipsos, Trudeau's approval rating is now below that of U.S. President Donald Trump. The new poll found that Trudeau's approval rating is now at just 40 percent. Trump is currently sitting at 43 percent. The Liberals' recently released federal budget did little to improve things. If the federal election was held tomorrow, the Conservatives would receive 40 percent of the vote and the Liberals only 30 percent. The poll said the NDP would receive around 21 percent, while the Bloc Québécois would garner 5 percent. In Seat Rich, Ontario, the Tories have a 12-point lead over the Liberals at 40 percent. And in Alberta, the Conservatives are way ahead at 63 percent, compared to just 17 percent for the Liberals. So we hit the streets of Lethbridge today and asked your thoughts of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Overall, I don't think so. Um, I grew up in a farming community. And I think the focus right now is definitely not on farms or agriculture or prairie provinces. Had some good intentions, I guess, but you know, he just, he doesn't really relay them that well. You know, the whole people kind, stuff like that, the stuff he goes back on, he goes back on a few of his words and, um, you know, sexual harassment, stuff like that. Doesn't really seem like he's even behind some of his own stuff. Yeah, I don't think he's done, done what he said he would. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he's sorry for disrespecting an Indigenous protester during a Liberal fundraising event in Toronto last night. The woman was hoping to draw attention to the mercury contamination in various First Nation communities. The PM was in Halifax today where he expressed regret for sarcastically thanking the woman who was being dragged off by security for the donation her group made to get into the venue. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. People in Rocky Narrow are suffering from mercury poisoning. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for your donation tonight. I really appreciate the uh, donation to the Liberal Party of Canada. As uh, I think you all know, uh, from time to time, uh, I'm in situations where uh, people are, are uh, you know, expressing concerns or protesting a particular thing, and I always try to be respectful and always try to uh, uh, engage with them in a positive way. That's how I believe uh, democracy should function, and I didn't do that last night. Last night, I lacked respect towards them, and I apologize for that. Canadians are concerned about the impact on the cost of living. This is due in part to the rising cost of gasoline, with a carbon tax partly to blame. Alan Nelson, a local trucker, says the fuel was not always his most expensive overhead. Fuel has become uh, our number one cost in the trucking industry. When I got into the business uh, 47 years ago, I think it was a smaller percentage that wages would have been probably the biggest cost. Uh, fuel now eats up a lot of that. So we have to be very fuel conscious. Uh, when there are uh, um, large increases, uh, we do pass on some of that. We're able to pass on some of that to customers through a, a fuel uh, uh, surcharge. UCP leader Jason Kenney has said if he's elected Premier on April 16th, he will repeal the federal government's carbon tax. For decades, Alberta used to be known as a have province. Since the inception of equalization payments, it is a heated debate over who pays what and who gets what amount. An associate professor of economics at the University of Calgary spoke at SACPA today and said misleading claims and arguments on the topic are far too common. You can find uh, frustrations with the program in every single province of the country and it has been a focus uh, of intense political discussion and debate for Canada's entire history. And so what we're seeing in Alberta is not new. Um, it certainly is a complex program and so it's uh, completely understandable that there is misunderstanding around it just because we tend not to dive into the details. We really just see that payments go elsewhere and we wonder why we don't receive any here. Many in the rural regions of our province are looking forward to heading to the polls on April 16th. Residents in smaller towns and villages appear to share the same concerns as those in larger municipalities like Lethbridge. Ainsley O'Reilly chatted with some of the rural candidates and discovered what their biggest concerns were heading into the Alberta provincial election. If you live across the Lethbridge city limits, the Coaldale political race is heating up. Two candidates from both the Liberal and Alberta party want you to know why you should vote for them. 
honestly, I don't know if there'd actually be one best candidate. Um, I know that right now at this point in time, I think we need a little bit of common sense and a little bit of something from our middle class and not just from our upper classes. Well, I would say I'm the best candidate uh, partially because of the, uh, of the party I represent, but partially because of what I represent too. Um, far too often, um, finding that the rural communities like Tabor Warner are getting kind of put to the wayside over the needs of Calgary and Edmonton. In Coaldale's upcoming election, it's important to remember all the candidates are everyday people who have families and own local businesses. Despite their differences, they all have one thing in common, the need to serve rural communities. I've actually spoke with uh, members of town council in a couple different communities and they said one of the big things that they're running into is uh, just cuts in infrastructure funding for, for the small communities because it's all going towards Calgary and Edmonton. And uh, that, again, these communities just seem to be uh, kind of put by the wayside. They're not, getting, they're not getting the attention they deserve. They're not getting the, uh, you know, the proper funding. They're as vital of a part of Alberta as Calgary, as Edmonton, to a lesser extent as Lethbridge too, but uh, they're, they're kind of being forgotten that way. A lot of it has to do with our small business and with our agriculture. They, they don't get enough attention because the small businesses are what drive our smaller communities because you, you don't find things like Walmart out here or Costco. So you really depend on those small businesses. And at the same time, a lot of us are, have something to do in agriculture. So we, we, we need to find that balance, you know, for our rural communities that we're not overtaxing these. If you aren't voting for Jason Beekman or Amy Yates, the NDP candidate is Laura Ross Giroux, and the UPC representative is Grant Hunter. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. Who you vote for next month will have a direct impact on your child's education. Now that's according to Donna Trimble, the executive director of Parents for Choice in Education. Trimble says we should really do our homework to get to know where each candidate stands, especially when it comes to what our kids are being taught. We need to remember that the 87 people that we elect in 20 days are the lawmakers for the next three, four years in our province. And they're going to have a huge impact on what education looks like in this province. We're in a really bad place right now and we need a government in place that's gonna honor parents as the primary caregivers and educators of their children. So please do your homework and vote wisely. Catch the full interview with Donna Tremble with Parents for Choice in Education coming up in the second half of our show. Also, be sure to check out the poll on our website which asks, when it comes to our children's education, which provincial party do you feel best represents the interests of parents and children heading into the April 16th Alberta election? Let us know your thoughts at bridgecitynews.ca. The good news about election time is that many regions receive pre-election goodies. You don't have to look any further than the new $100 million bridge promised to the city of Lethbridge with construction beginning in 2022. The downside is that many times government spending gets out of control creating a large deficit in debt. Steve Lafleur is a senior policy analyst with the Fraser Institute and he says with the current Alberta NDP government our budget may not be balanced for quite some time. The current government has attempted to um, make spending and revenue line up by increasing taxes. Unfortunately it really hasn't had the impact that was expected and as, as it stands right now, the government expects to run deficits until uh, at least 2023, 24, uh, which is a long way off, especially given that we've only had one short budget balance since uh, 2008, 2009. Um, at some point, you know, we have to have expenditures line up with revenue and it's just not happening right now. Mr. Lafleur will have more on Alberta's fiscal picture coming up after business news. Even though we received quite a bit of snow this winter in southwestern Alberta, many farmers are concerned about dry soil conditions. Although the recent sunshine and blue sky is great, many are still praying for rain. There really is no quick fix for this. It's, uh, you rely upon Mother Nature to do the, uh, the work for you and uh, hopefully uh, it does come through with some timely rain. And uh, like I, there's probably enough of moisture in the, in the ground right now to germinate the crop, but it's certainly gonna need some help to uh, get it through. The big problem is the last few years, like it's kind of turned off the tap in, in June and not uh, put any rain in, uh, into the growing season when it's most needed. And uh, that really does have an economic downturn looking af ahead. And uh, of course, there's lots of other outstanding issues like our, our uh, trade uh, with China for the canola. 
uh, that's certainly going to have an influence on what crops are produced and uh, you may be looking at more people growing feed wheat or wheat and barley than, uh, than you did before because canola was quite a popular crop. So, uh, you know, pricing varies on what you grow and how much of it you grow. According to Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, last year southern Alberta crops suffered as farmers had to contend with the driest soil in 50 years. Earth Day is coming up on April 22nd, but the UFL is getting a head start. The Faculty of Arts and Science held a symposium where students could ask some very important questions. Apparently the university is very thorough when it comes to recycling. Well, we recycle pretty much everything. Any, we recycle styrofoam, batteries, light bulbs, metal, plastic, cardboard, paper, uh, compost, uh, all different stuff. And we actually recycle the styrofoam on campus. So we actually have a company that comes out and actually melts the styrofoam here on campus and makes um, frames and car bumpers, different things like that, they reuse the styrofoam. Starting on October 1st, the city has implemented a $50 fine per ton of garbage that is put into the recycling bin. Honeybees are generally given a bad rap for being aggressive and a nuisance by setting up their hives in inconvenient places for homeowners. Bees are an important part of our ecosystem, helping to sustain our way of life. Part of the reason why we started the organization is because there wasn't enough attention on wild bee conservation or research. We really felt as though that was a big gap. So we're, we're here to try and fill that gap and also just to make sure that people are aware of the difference between our wild bees and managed bees in Alberta as well. So bees like honeybees are, are non-native and they're a livestock species. Uh, and there's just a handful of honeybee species, whereas we have 321 wild bee species in the province that we need to spend a lot more time and research and, and efforts on making sure that their populations are okay. We are quite data deficient with regard to our wild bees, but we do know uh, especially a, a fair amount about bumblebees. So we know that some of our bumblebees are totally okay, but we know that some other bumblebee species are declining. So we need to really better understand the reasons behind those declines as well as um, implement some conservation measures to to help protect them as well. Evan says her ultimate goal is to determine how the populations are doing. She says her organization is looking at how weather patterns and climate change affect honeybees. The city's Lethbridge 311 service is up and running and so far there's been a good response since it opened about two weeks ago. According to city officials, customer service specialists answered close to 1,500 calls in week one and almost 1,600 in week two. Close to 40% of residents dialed 311 directly while other calls were redirected. Stats show 80% of calls have been for information, while 20% for service requests. Lethbridge 311 provides residents with one place for answers on city programs and services. RCMP and Fort McLeod are looking for vandals. Sometime during Sunday evening, the perpetrators busted into the Fort Museum courtyard and caused extensive damage to the property as several windows, doors and walls were smashed. If you have any information about this break and enter, call the Fort McLeod RCMP detachment or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Facebook is extending its ban on hate speech by not allowing the promotion or support of white nationalism and white separatism. The company previously allowed such material even though it has long banned white supremacists. Facebook said today that it's extending its ban on hate speech to include white nationalists and white separatists. And this is in addition to um, the ban of white supremacist and white supremacist ideas that it has um, banned for a long time. The company uh, previously believed that there was a distinction between these groups, that just because you're a white nationalist, it doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're in a hate group or that you promote violence against other groups. But um, after pressure from academics and civil rights groups, it uh, decided that this is not the case that these groups cannot be meaningfully separated from each other. If you search for terms associated with these groups, you won't get results for your search, but you'll be directed to a group called Life After Hate, and that's uh, a group founded by former extremists who are helping people to get out of these violent extremist groups. So I think enforcement is always a challenge. Facebook uses artificial intelligence and, and a whole bunch of human moderators to find uh, objectionable material but it doesn't find everything and people are always uh, getting smarter at evading its detections. So I think a lot of groups have praised uh, this new ban, but there are a lot of questions as to how Facebook is going to be able to enforce it. Police in Seattle, Washington say a man opened fire on motorists and what authorities call a random attack that left two people dead and two others injured on Wednesday. One man was fatally shot and another killed in a car crash. A warning now, some of the images you're about to see are graphic. 
We got a gentleman who lives in the area uh, for some reason that uh, came outside with a, with a hand with a gun, attempted to carjack a vehicle, shot the woman driving the vehicle. The vehicle veered off the road. At that point in time, a metro bus was southbound on Sandpoint Way. The suspect then opened fire on the metro bus, striking the driver. The driver was able to back the bus up and turn it around and get it out of the area where it is currently where you see it right now to a safe area where we were able to get aid to him and to the passengers on the bus. At that point, the suspect then carjacked another vehicle, shooting and killing the driver of that vehicle. Officers arrived, tried to engage the suspect in dialogue. The suspect didn't just close the vehicle door, drove off. Officers pursued him for about a block and a half, at which point in time that suspect then ran head on into another vehicle that was driving northbound, uh, killing the driver of that car. At that point in time, through negotiations, uh, the officers were able to get the suspect out of the vehicle and then get him taken into custody. Survivors of the mosque attacks in New Zealand described the terror at a door they could not open while trying to escape the shooting at a mosque. The minute I listened to the, to the imam speech and then I heard the gun. That, that, and the, that, 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 I know this is machine gun. I heard it, my friend. Hey, guys, someone shooting, someone shooting, run away, run away. It's when to open the door, this blocked that, not open. And all the people run away, run from that side and this side. The door was, doesn't open, open, doesn't open. I didn't know about this button. That's a new one. At least 17, at least. Yeah, at least for all of them come. One by one, one by one, on the top, yeah. At least 19 people were killed and about 70 were injured when a fire broke out in an office building in Bangladesh's capital, Dhaka. At least 19 firefighting units were working to douse the blaze and rescue people from inside of a tower in the city's busy commercial district. Military helicopters later joined in the rescue mission. A group of dedicated firefighters closer to town is braving the elements this week. As Loris Alexander reports, it is all part of the annual rooftop campout in support of Muscular Dystrophy Canada. This is the 13th year the Lethbridge Fire Department will take part in the rooftop campout, a nationwide fundraiser for Muscular Dystrophy Canada. As a firefighter, um, I feel like we have a kind of an obligation to give back to the community and this is a, a great, great cause for us to be able to support and I mean coming out for four days, um, that's easy, right? The people with muscular dystrophy, they have the real battle um, and this is easy for us. So um, we're glad to be out here, we're glad to be doing this and raising awareness and money for muscular dystrophy. Muscular Dystrophy Canada has roughly 9,800 registered clients with neuromuscular disorders across the country. As far as us working with firefighters, that's really gone back to the beginning of our history in 1954. So it's coming up on 65 years now that we've partnered with firefighters. And the rooftop campout uh, started back in 2006. So I believe that's 13 years now that they've been camping out. Vanderland says that firefighters raise 30% of muscular dystrophy Canada's total revenue, about 3.2 million annually. They're really part of our entire foundation. Without the firefighters, uh, we as, a, as an organization wouldn't be able to help the, uh, the community and the individuals that we do. So uh, they're, they're a part of us in every sense of the word. Firefighters will be camped out on the roof until Sunday, March 31st. Anyone looking to help can visit the crew members at Hudson's Pub. Almost 50,000 Canadians suffer from muscular dystrophy across Canada. This is the 13th edition here in Lethbridge. If you could contribute to this great cause, firefighters across the country would be eternally grateful to you. For Bridge City News, I'm Loris Alexander. Such a great cause. We had quite a bit of sunshine again today, but slightly cooler. The mercury will be climbing just in time for the weekend. I'll have a complete look at the weather picture in just a moment. We had lots of blue sky and sunshine again today. Tonight, mainly clear and cooling off to minus 6. Mainly sunny again tomorrow with a high of 10 degrees. Saturday, blue sky, sunshine and a high near 13. Cooling off slightly on Sunday with a high near 11 expected. Monday, the mercury will climb again to 14. A low pressure system returns on Tuesday, bringing a chance of flurries and a high of only plus 2. Expect flurries and a high of only 1 degree on Wednesday. Checking the almanac, the average high for this time of year is 9 and an average low of minus 4.
The highest temperature on the state was recorded in 1966 at 19 degrees, and the record low was a chilly minus 26 in 1954. Sunrise was at 718, sunset at 755. Let's have a look at how tomorrow's shaping up across the country now. Just a few clouds for Victoria and a high of 14. Clearing in Vancouver and a high of 13. Sunny in Calgary with a high of 8. Mainly sunny in Edmonton tomorrow and a high near 7. A mixture of sun and cloud in Regina and a high of 4. Mainly cloudy and 3 degrees is on tap for Saskatoon. Expect flurries and 3 for Winnipeg. In the central part of the country, Toronto will be mainly cloudy and 9. Ottawa will have rain mixed with snow and a high of 6. Montreal will be mostly cloudy and 6 as well. In the Maritimes, Frederick to New Brunswick will have rain and 7. Halifax, Nova Scotia will be overcast to 9. Charlottetown PEI will have spring showers and 7. And in St. John's, Newfoundland, expect an overcast day and a high of 6 degrees on Friday. The Icelandic budget airline Wow Air ceased operations today. The closure stranded passengers across two continents. I mean, it came as a real surprise. Um, this morning, like I said, I was boarding my flight and it said, hey, your connecting flight is cancelled. We are very sorry. And I, I couldn't believe it. So uh, that's kind of what the situation is right now. What happened with Wow Air said that they went under. So uh, we rushed the airport and now we're trying to figure out how to get home. We live in Boston, Massachusetts. We got to work tomorrow. So don't really think that's going to happen. <laughs> I get a message saying flight cancelled and I'm trying to figure out what's going on and some lady at a desk tells me how uh, they just went bankrupt. A jury in the United States has just awarded $80 million in damages to a California man in a high-stakes trial over his claim that Monsanto's Roundup weed killer caused his cancer. The agribusiness giant says it will appeal the decision. Today, the jury sent a message loud and clear that companies should no longer put products on the market for anyone to buy without being truthful, without testing their product, and without warning if it causes cancer. And today, that message has been heard, we hope, by Monsanto. <laughs> I'm really proud of the Hardemans for taking on one of the most powerful and largest companies in the world. And today, history was made. Today, the jury unanimously held Monsanto responsible for causing this man's cancer. Well, I would like to thank the ladies and gentlemen of the jury for giving up of their time for this case. Um, I very much appreciate it. We appreciate it. The firm G3 says it plans to build two new high-efficiency grain elevators in Alberta. One will be built near Iracana and the second in Stetler County. The new elevators will have a capacity of 42,000 metric tons along with a railway loop track that can accommodate a 150-car unit train. The Winnipeg-based company says the elevators will give farmers a new choice to market their grain while saving them time and money. Pending regulatory approvals, construction is set to begin later this summer. Now, here's a look at today's markets. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, a recent Ipsos poll puts Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's approval rating at just 40 percent. That is below U.S. President Donald Trump's 43 percent. As for the Liberal Party, they are currently running second to Andrew Scheer's Tories with only 30 percent of the vote. The Conservatives currently have 40 percent. As expected, the Tories are most popular in Alberta with 63 percent support, the Liberals 
only have 17%. The Alberta election is coming up April 16th. There is one group which is quite concerned about where our education system is headed in the province. Hear what Donna Trimble from Parents for Choice in Education has to say next. But first, here's a look what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. The third annual CB Saturday is taking place March 30th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization. More than 20 exhibitors will be selling everything from plants and seeds to garden tools. Plus, a seed swap will be taking place, so all are encouraged to bring extra seeds to give away. Take in several workshops on topics like bees and creating healthy soil. Admission is free and all are welcome. For more information, visit environmentlethbridge.ca slash Saturday. It's the 15th annual Woods Homes Children's Benefit Gala taking place Saturday, March 30th at 6 p.m. at the Coast Hotel Lethbridge. This special night is in support of the emergency youth shelter, The Core. This year's gala includes a delicious dinner, silent and live auctions, and live entertainment by the Chevelles. For tickets, contact Colleen Campbell by calling 403-317-1777 or visit woodshomes.ca. If you're looking for a new-to-you bike, come out to the Lethbridge Bike Swap at Exhibition Park's North Pavilion on Saturday, April 27th. Sell, buy, or donate a bike. Admission is $2 for adults and kids 12 and under are free. Bikes can be dropped off at 9 a.m. Find all kinds of used bikes that are refurbished or can be purchased as is. For more information, visit albertabikeswap.ca. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. There are many important issues in the Alberta provincial election, which is just around the corner, one of them being education. What should our kids be taught? Also, how, when, and where? How much input should parents have in all of this? Our guests today are Donna Trimble, Executive Director of Parents for Choice in Education, and a concerned parent who's becoming a regular contributor here on BCN, Catherine Furukawa. Ladies, welcome to BCN, and let's talk education. Donna, first with you, what does your organization, Parents for Choice in Education, advocate for? What is it all about? Well, we just have one primary mission, and that is to advocate for high quality, excellent education through maximum parental choice. And that means that there needs to be two key ingredients. Parents have to be able to choose the kind of and style and location of the education of their own children. And schools must be able to provide the setting that those parents are requesting, both what they're requesting regarding the scholastics as well as their cultures and values. And unfortunately, both of those things are being deeply hindered right now in the province. Uh, you mentioned a couple of concerns. What about funding? Is that also a concern for you? Oh, for sure. There are three key areas, actually, where I think that choice can either be hindered or improved upon, and those would be funding, right? So providing the funding needed to allow parents to access a variety of locations. Curriculum and resources provided in the schools, are these open-ended and based on outcomes that can be tested nationally and internationally that are skills-based, or is there a form of uh, indoctrination, that kind of thing happening within the curriculum and resources, uh, how those are modeled can impact choice. And of course, after those two things, there's communication with parents. So the ability to read report cards, but also the ability of school staff to communicate openly with parents. And right now we have legal restrictions on that. So all three of those things impact choice and all of them um, can either be improved or, or damaged. Now, Catherine, as a mom of two young girls, what are some of your concerns of what's being taught in schools today? Um, Hal, I think that big concerns for me with my oldest being in kindergarten, when I look at potential changes to our curriculum with social studies and maybe facts being altered to being taught as what is fair rather than what is factual information in social studies or in health class. Certainly when my girls get to an age where they are in sexual education classes, I would definitely have some concerns with what's being taught there in terms of what is age appropriate um, and what lines up with our morals and values as a family. And how about you, Donna? What are some of your concerns with the current curriculum? Um, to be honest with you, I think that the problem with the current curriculum is how it's being developed. So what we would like to see is that there be um, outreach to end users, people like those post-secondary professors that are welcoming our grade 12 students, entrepreneurs, tradespeople. What is it that they need on a scholastic basis? Actual literacy, numeracy, science, those kinds of outcomes. And then that should be de developed back so that you have very, very strong outcome skills-based 
uh, parameters in place that can be tested. As for how it's taught, what is taught, what the focuses are, we feel like that should be completely freed up, right? So the schools, the teachers in the classroom should be able to follow the passions of the students, whether that's the arts, whether that's a history base, whether that's a faith base or a second language or sports, it shouldn't matter so long as at the end of every school year using something like a national or international uh, testing system like the Canadian test for basic skills, each school classroom can prove that they're not leaving any students behind or they're doing the best they can to make sure students are at grade level. The rest of it should be completely freed up and that would get away uh, us away from this tendency, regardless of what government's in place, of governments using the curriculum to push their own ideas, their own worldviews, their own ideologies. That's unacceptable. We should be giving the power of what and how it's taught back to the schools and just testing for those skills. Catherine, you expressed earlier about your concerns about what's being taught when it comes to sex ed, the sex ed curriculum. Do you think maybe kids are being taught a little too much too soon? I would think absolutely they are. Um, as consent age in Canada has gone down over the years, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is right for our children to be exposed and knowledgeable about all that they can potentially consent to. I think that we are starting to expose our children far too early to things that are far above their maturity level. Now, Donna, you say one of the things you want to see in an MLA is a desire to restore parents as primary caregivers and educators of their own children instead of legislating secrecy. Can you explain that? Right. So we've had over the past, since the PC government prior to this NDP government, the passage of education legislation under things like Bill 10 and Bill 24, Bill 24 being the most recent legislation. And that legislation puts a legal framework in place that completely removes the capacity of staff to use their professional judgment to decide when it is most important to reach out to parents in relation to, say, sexual and gender concerns that that child may have in the classroom. We think that's incredibly dangerous. It's unfair and it deteriorates the partnership between teachers and parents. So. Staff need to have the capacity to reach out to parents when they deem it necessary for the safety and care of students. And parents need to feel confident that they will be kept in the loop with regards to the most important needs of their kids. The other thing that Bill 24 did is it removed the restrictions to sexual education or sexual content within uh, gay straight alliances, queer straight alliances, these types of student clubs, meaning the material that right now a parent is provided with that, for, that you must have notification and opt out provisions for in the classroom, that exact same material can be provided to children in clubs, in school, during school hours, and a parent would not be told. So it's an exception sh that should be reversed. Um, so things like that are of grave concern. So we would, we would ask actually for the complete removal of all of the changes that were incurred by the unconstitutional passage of Bill 24. Uh, there's much more that that does that we probably don't have enough time to talk about today. But the bottom line is because of that, that legislation, we have children that are increasingly isolated, a breakdown of the parent-child bond, a breakdown of the teacher-parent partnership, and a removal of the autonomy of schools to actually meet the needs of children in their own classrooms. And it's completely unacceptable. Catherine, let me ask you something as a concerned mom of two girls. How important is that relationship between parent and teacher? For me, Hal, it's incredibly important. When I dropped my daughter off for kindergarten this year, her teacher sent home a note with all of us with a care package, a Kleenex to dry our eyes, a tea bag to go home and relax with a cup of tea. But in her note, she said, we are partnering in this. And for me, that is so imperative to education because I can't be with my child all the time. I'm not a teacher, but I certainly want it to be a partnership, what we are doing at home and what's happening at school that we're working together that I know what's being taught at school so that we can encourage that at home and help develop those skills in our daughters. So those open lines of communication are vital, aren't they? 100%. For the success of the education of your kids. Absolutely. Now, Parents for Choice in Education would also like to see the autonomy of schools restored so that they can offer the settings that families desire and expect, including faith-based choices, Donna? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the bottom line is that parents are primarily sending their children to school because they want them to be competitive on the world stage after graduation. They want them well taught in those basic educational skills, but they also want to know that their cultures and values will be respected. All of us live in a pluralistic and diverse society and that needs to be respected. Presently, we have a government in place that is actually threatening to shut down some up to 24, 25 of our faith-based independent schools and other independent schools that want to maintain their autonomy in relation to how they teach their students about how to be um, anti-bullying policies, safe and caring policies, all of that kind of stuff. We can't have that kind of overreach from government. That isn't what a free society looks like. And so again, that is something that came into place with the passage of Bill 24 and needs to be reversed. So Catherine, how important is that to you for having faith-based options available for you and your family? Um, for us, it's very important. Our daughter who's in kindergarten right now goes to a Catholic school. And while we are not pa practicing Catholics, we are a faith-based family. And so for us, there are many similarities in what they're taught in religion to what we practice in our home. And that was a huge determining factor in us deciding what school we would send our daughter to. And you know what? I did the same with my children when they were younger, growing up in southern Ontario. We didn't have the funding to put them into a private school, a Christian school. So the next best thing for us was the Catholic school system. But the fundamentals were taught there. So we really appreciated yeah. that, right? And having that structure at the same time with God and with mm -hmm. Jesus and what that relationship means. So Donna, with these important education issues on the table, Albertans really need to know who they should vote for. How is Parents for Choice in Education helping citizens really get ready for the big election coming up? You know what, I would, I would tell everyone out there that's listening to this broadcast to go to our website at parentchoice.ca. Right at the top of our website page, as well as in our blog stream, you're going to find a, a fantastic resource. I don't mean to toot our own horn, but the bottom line is that this resource is going to provide you the one-stop shop to get to know your candidates in your area. And that's exactly what the resource is called, Get to Know Your Candidates. We are nonpartisan, but the bottom line is that we provide you with a way to identify your riding, identify a list of candidates from all of the different parties that we have access to, their contact information, key questions to ask, as well as backgrounder information on stuff like Bill 10, Bill 24, the ramifications to your children's education as a result of the, those pieces of unconstitutional law that have been put in place and other issues around parental choice and education. So please come to our website and you're going to be able to really quickly get to know your candidates. We need to remember that the 87 people that we elect in 20 days are the lawmakers for the next three, four years in our province. And they're going to have a huge impact on what education looks like in this province. We're in a really bad place right now, and we need a government in place that's gonna honor parents as the primary caregivers and educators of their children. So please do your homework and vote wisely. Yeah, it's so important to be well-educated before we go out and vote on April 16th. Catherine, what are some of the important election issues for you when it comes to your children's education? Uh, definitely that parental choice for us is incredibly important. Like Donna mentioned, it um, starts to kind of teeter on that line of infringing on our freedom of speech when we start to take this um, responsibility away from parents from being able to pick what their education looks like for their children. And so for my husband and I, this is the first election that I have children who are school aged and for us it is a very huge issue in this election, education platforms are definitely something that we will be watching. So Donna, do most people tend to just sit back and watch? Do we need more parents to do more than just vote, but to maybe get involved to make things happen? Absolutely, that's another thing that we say in our resource. We did yesterday also release a secondary resource seven days into this election writ, and that provides as much information as we could find as of yesterday, the publication date on the education platforms of as many parties as we could find information on. So you can find that at the top of our blog at parentchoice.ca. And in that we remind you, if you find a candidate that you really believe in, please consider volunteering, consider financially supporting. It really makes a difference to have people door knocking on the ground, putting in signs. If you really believe in a candidate, please support them. It's just 20 days and it's the next four years of our lives. So it's a really important thing to be involved in. Personally, I feel like people are paying more and more attention. 
our base in particular is incredibly involved. So become a part of that base, sign up for our newsletters and let's take education back in this province. What about asking the candidates, what will you do to ensure that teachers deal with controversial issues by promoting critical inquiry rather than advocacy and to teach students how to think rather than what to think? Well, you know what? We have, um, I believe it's six key open-ended questions available again on that get to know your candidates resource so that you can really dig deep when you're talking to these candidates. You can even have them at the door, print it up. So if somebody shows up at your door door knocking, you can ask these open-ended questions and it's gonna let you do two things. It's gonna let you identify whether your candidate cares about education and understands it deeply. So that's number one. And number two, where do they stand? Do they really understand what choice looks like? Because you say, you know what, we believe in education choice. Does that mean giving people the superficial ability to pick Catholic, public, independent without an understanding of the way that all of those settings are being manipulated and infringed upon from the inside out through legislation so that they're all becoming one size fits all institutions and just different by name. Um, that's the depth of understanding candidates need to bring to the table in education this go around because that's what's happening. So it's not enough for a candidate to look at you at the door and say, you know what, we believe in choice. What does that mean? Do you think that this legislation that's being passed should, and the way that curriculum is being developed and funding models, all of these things, do you think that government needs to get out of the way so that education settings can actually provide a unique product that parents are asking for because right now that is not what is happening. So that's right on our website. So Catherine, rather than advocacy, how about teaching students how to think rather than what to think? I think that's super important, Hal. Uh, when we teach our children to think as opposed to what to think, our education programs become about the children and less about a government agenda that we're trying to push on our children while we are educating them. Especially if we don't agree with those ideologies, right? 100 percent, yeah. Donna Trimble, Executive Director of Parents for Choice in Education and Concerned Parent, Catherine Furukawa. Ladies, thank you both so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having us. Alberta's fiscal situation has been on the decline, going from a positive balance a decade ago to now being in the hole for about $28 billion in net debt. We all agree things need to change, but what will have to happen to make things change? Joining me now is Steve LaFleur, Senior Policy Analyst at the Fraser Institute and one of the authors of the paper entitled Spending Work for Alberta, Balancing the Need for Deficit Elimination and Tax Reform. Steve, welcome back to BCN. Thank you for having me. Now, what are the basic tools any government has to do to eliminate the budget deficit? What are the options? Well, um... To, to an extent, the current government has attempted to um, make spending and revenue line up by increasing taxes. Unfortunately, it really hasn't had the impact that was expected. And as, as it stands right now, the government expects to run deficits until uh, at least 2023, 24, uh, which is a long way off, especially given that we've only had one short budget balance since uh, 2008, 2009. Um, at some point, you know, we have to have expenditures line up with revenue and it's just not happening right now. Now, when I look at my own household budget and I see that there's a deficit, the common sense thing to do is, what most of us would do, is reduce some spending until things get back to where they need to be, back in black. How much would Alberta need to cut back in spending to get the books balanced? Well, it really depends because there are a lot of factors involved. Um, while the budgetary balance is important, it's not the only thing that's important. Um, one other thing that is important is having a competitive environment for businesses and entrepreneurs to invest. And unfortunately, with the increases in personal and corporate income taxes, um, Alberta's competitive standing has declined by a lot. In fact, even if we went back to the 10% single personal and corporate income tax rate, given federal changes here and federal changes in the United States, we would not get back to where we were in 2014 in terms of our relative standing where we were the lowest corporate and personal income tax jurisdiction in North America. So if we want to do something about that, it'll be uh, more challenging. But if we simply had the one goal of balancing the budget, we could simply spend um, at the 2018-19 level until 2020-21, and then we'd have a balanced budget. So there are many different options, uh, but it's important to recognize that this is just one of many issues that uh, need addressing. 
Many people agree that the 11% may be a tough pill to swallow, but I believe your report shows that Alberta spends 21% more than BC. If BC can do this, should we not also be able to do this too? Yeah, so the 11% is what would be required if we were to bring tax rates down to the point where the corporate income tax was, again, at the lowest level or tied for the lowest level in this case um, with uh, our competitor jurisdictions. Um, so that would require reducing spending by 11%, uh, which could either be done immediately or over time, depending on how much of a tolerance the government has for debt accumulation. Um, I think that uh, I think that it would be um, challenging, but not impossible and not unprecedented. So as you pointed out, the government of British Columbia spends uh, about 20% more uh, per, per person on program spending than Alberta does. And, and it's really hard to find a good justification for why that has to be the case. And as much as it can be difficult to reduce expenditures, um, it has been done before. Um, the Klein government reduced spending far more than that, uh, around 20% over three years. Um, so it's, it's doable, but it would require some tough decisions. And frankly, part of the problem in Alberta is that we haven't made a lot of tough decisions in a very long time. Um, as, as I stated earlier, we've had budget deficits since 2008, 2009. So we've essentially gone through two different recessions in Alberta and haven't been able to balance the budget since. And if we can't balance the budget when we're not in a recession, uh, it's, I, I don't know when we're going to do it. And that's a real problem because as much as we used to have a very low debt load, we're getting to the point now where we're on track to get to about half the per capita rate of Quebec. And when you're thinking about a province that had a net asset surplus, you know, we had $35 billion in the black which was unprecedented in Canada. And now we're talking about being on the same trajectory as provinces like Quebec and Ontario. That's, that's a problem and we need to address that sooner rather than later. So just like a regular household, we need to determine where we should cut back on the spending. A number of other studies suggest the areas, one where we could cut back, public sector compensation, government employee wages, healthcare and education. But Steve, these are the three areas where most politicians fear to dread. Well, the challenge is that people always want to find efficiencies and they always want to cut waste. The reality is that efficiencies are hard to come by without actually uh, either reducing some sort of service or reducing some employment levels or compensation. And waste is mostly just at the margins. Um, it's not like the government is you know, buying gold-plated pencils or anything. Um, so we need to have a serious conversation about how we're spending money. and. One of the challenges is that with public sector compensation, generally there's kind of an implicit bargain that government jobs are very stable. Um, they have a lot of uh, benefits. So for instance, they're much more likely to have uh, public sector pension plans. Um, they're, they, they tend to have more job security. Um, so there's kind of a trade-off. You know, if you work for the public sector for 25 years versus somebody who you know works at a job for three or four years and then switches jobs, there's more stability that comes with that. So it's not really clear why we need to pay um, a large premium for public sector employers versus their private sector counterparts, especially when the environment for the private sector right now is so challenging. Now, Steve, what about taxes? Some would argue that raising corporate income tax is a good thing because in theory, the government would receive more money to spend on programs to help society. From your research, is that necessarily true? The corporate income tax is an interesting one because it's, it's a category of taxation that generally a lot of politicians have been very prudent about. So for instance, the Kretschian government um, reduced corporate income taxes because they recognize the competitive challenges that, that high corporate income taxes created. So while we, we do look at it as though it's just something that very wealthy people pay somehow, the reality is that's, that's not how the corporate income tax works. Um, essentially, there are three ways that corporate income tax can be passed off. It can be passed off to shareholders in part, it can be passed off to um, to employees in lower wages, um, and it can be um, passed on to consumers in terms of prices. So it's not just one person or one group of people to pay. Everybody pays it to an extent. And the challenge with something like the corporate income tax is that you're essentially saying you're essentially taxing something that's good um, when you're producing uh, goods for the economy. That's that's a good thing. There's a benefit to that. Um, so some people suggest instead, or some economists suggest, you know, taxing consumption or that type of thing instead. So these two different things have different effects because they create different incentives. If you're taxing consumption, then you're, you're 
um, incentivizing people to invest instead of spending, for instance. So how you tax is nearly as important as how much you tax. So if our province was to reduce the corporate income tax rate, what would you say to Albertans who argue that this amounts to basically a handout for the rich? Well, it isn't something that just the rich pay. So, you know, if, if uh, the studies have shown that employee wage growth tends to decrease whenever uh, corporate income taxes are increased, because, you know, if you take away, if, if you take away revenue from a company, they'll just have less to pay out. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not really much more complicated than that. Um, so as much as it's tempting to say we're going to target the wealthy, the reality is that it's not an effective way to do that. Do corporate income tax increases simply get passed along to consumers in the form of higher prices? Well, they certainly can. Um, you know, at the end of the day, companies exist to make money. And if they can't make money at a, a given price level, they have really not much alternative but to increase prices. Now, our provincial economy is competing against other economies around the world. Perhaps our largest competitor is the United States. They recently slashed their corporate tax rates while other, ours has gone up. So how, what kind of effect will this have on our economy here? Well, it certainly doesn't help. When you think about all the barriers that our biggest industry, or our biggest export industry, the energy industry has with respect to market access and price differentials, we're already at a disadvantage. And then when you look at the fact that we went from having a lower corporate income tax rate than all of our competitors to now having a, a higher rate, that certainly doesn't help with the margin when a company is deciding whether they want to invest in Colorado, Texas, or Alberta. Uh, money flows pretty freely around the world. And if we're saying that we're going to tax it at a greater rate, then it's we're, we're going to lose sometimes as a result. Now, you also write about longer-term fiscal goals and reducing our reliance on resource revenues and repairing the Heritage Fund. How can we practically reduce our reliance on natural resources? And does Alberta have to really reinvent itself? Well, it's not about reinventing itself. The trouble is that natural resource revenues are very volatile year to year. And also, they create a great temptation to simply spend while the going is good. Uh, ideally, the Lougheed government had a, had a really good idea when it came to this, and that was to create the Heritage Fund to ensure that a portion of resource revenue was saved for, you know, for rainy days. And we haven't done that to a, to a large extent. We've had a, a small number of contributions since, I think, about the mid-80s. Um, we just haven't been making regular contributions, and as a result, we're just using it essentially to have, to, to avoid having higher taxes right now. And that's not necessarily the way you want to do it. What you want to do instead is ensure that it helps to have, it helps to create a long-term uh, stream of income rather than one-off expenditures here and there. So Steve, how do you think we should repair the Heritage Fund and how would it best be used? So that will be a long-term fix. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to make contributions to the Heritage Fund while it's running deficits. And given our challenges on tax competitiveness, we need to address that so that we can have the type of investment that will create uh, increases in resource revenue down the road. Um, but at the same time, because resource revenues have decreased over, over time, uh, that, that could make it easier to start thinking about this now because when you're, when you're dealing with large influxes, you know, when you have $12 billion a year coming in, it's very tempting to just spend it. Whereas if you have three or four billion, it's maybe a little easier to have that conversation because you're not sacrificing as much in the short term. But nevertheless, we, we have shorter term fiscal issues we need to take care of before we can do that. Um, and there are, there are different models that one could use. Um, you know, Alaska has a dividend system where they pay out a certain amount every year to citizens. Norway has a longer term model where they um, have a gigantic uh, reserve of funds that they invest and then they um, they use a certain amount, they draw a certain amount from it every year to fund government spending. There, there are different options, but the point is that we need to pick one of them. We can't just say, well, let's spend money now that we have it and then you know, hope it still keeps coming in at the exact same rate year over year. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So what's a comfortable amount having in the Heritage Fund and would some of that funding be used maybe as a contingency fund for emergencies such as flooding and fires? You know, it could be. They're just the thing. The, the the great thing about something like resource revenue is that it's it's a benefit that not a lot of places have in this kind of magnitude. 
um, the point is really not so much exactly how you want to use it, but that you use it in some kind of constructive way. If you're just saying that, you know, like what resource revenue fluctuates wildly. So if you get 12 billion one year and 8 billion the next year, and you're using that, you're counting on that to pay your day-to-day -day bills to keep the lights on, then that creates some real volatility in your budgeting, which probably means you're going to be running pretty regular deficits when there are fluctuations. So it's, it's not only just about um, saving for a rainy day, it's also about just ensuring the stability of public finances. Um, but this type of fix, you know, this is not the first priority. This is like the third priority, but it's an important long-term priority that we need to look at as a goal when we're thinking about getting the budget together. It's not just about not running deficits now. It's also about ensuring that we can plan for a sustainable fiscal future, and that's part of that. And I'm looking forward to seeing this province return to the black once again. Steve LaFleur, Senior Policy Analyst at the Fraser Institute, thanks a lot for joining me today from Calgary. Thank you for having me. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.